a lot of women talk about you need to see it to be it. And that really resonates with me because my first job, I had a woman boss and the woman that was running the entire organization was a, was, was a woman, the publisher. And so I saw it. I saw that it was possible. I was, they were role models to me and that really inspired me. Does talking about your money make you cringe? Are you tired of fighting about finances? Do you want to stop sabotaging your financial happiness? Then you are in the right place. Welcome to Breaking Money Silence, a podcast series aimed at helping all of us talk more openly about money. Your host, Kathleen Burns Kingsbury, is a wealth psychology expert who is doing what she does best, speaking about taboo topics. International speaker, author, and founder of KBK Wealth Connection, Kathleen understands money and our relationship with it. Over the past decade, she has empowered thousands of people to break money silence at home and at work. Now, here is Kathleen. I want to welcome Suzanne Syracuse. She's the founder and CEO of Suzanne Syracuse Consulting Services. She specializes in advising financial services firms on innovative business strategies, distinctive marketing programs, and impactful advocacy initiatives around diversity, financial literacy, and next-gen talent. Uh, Suzanne and I worked together when she was working as the former CEO and publisher of Investment News. Uh, She is a powerful leader, a fun person, and when I thought about doing this series on women, money, and power, she was one of the first people that I thought of. So welcome, Suzanne, to the Breaking Money Silence podcast. Um, Well, thank you so much, Kathleen. That was a great introduction, and I appreciate you having me on, and it's great to be here. Yeah, I'm very, very excited to get into this conversation. I feel like it's something that we have um, had over the course of years, just so people know. uh, We've worked together on and off at different conferences and different events. Suzanne is very uh, dedicated to the evolution of the financial advice Uh, profession and women leaders. Uh, She focuses in on women's leadership, diversity, inclusion, uh, next gen, and financial literacy. So we certainly have a lot to talk about and a lot to share. Um, But I'm wondering, Suzanne, you know, one of the things I've never really had an opportunity to ask you is that over the course of your career, which has been very um, distinguished, you've achieved uh, these positions of power that have historically been reserved for men. When I think about certainly the financial services industry, um, but the publishing industry, you really have been able to forge forward before a lot of other uh, women have done so. So tell me a little bit about what you think made you the person that could succeed in such a historically male-dominated business. Well, thank you for that. So when I, you know, think about this question, because I've been asked it a number of times, again, I was the the publisher for Investment News, uh, which uh, it was a print is a print digital events research, custom content publication media group for financial advisors. And before that, I, I worked at the Philadelphia Business Journal. So I've been in publishing. Or I was in publishing my entire career. I helped launch Investment News, and then was the publisher and CEO for the last fifteen years. When I when I think about how that all transpired. The first thing that always comes to mind for me was my parents and my, especially my father. You know, I grew up, you know, I'm, I'm in my early 50s and my mom and dad uh, never had the opportunity to go to college and they wanted the absolute best for me and wanted me to have a great education. That was always throughout my entire childhood growing up always encouraging me, never gave me the ability to think I couldn't do something, uh, very confidence building, et cetera. And I think my mom was was quite ahead of her time. She actually wanted to be a journalist, but in, in her day and age, in her generation, it was really a rarity for, for a woman to go, go to college back in, in the days that she grew up. So she didn't have that opportunity. And I think she really was excited when I wanted to be in media and in journalism and in marketing, because it was something that she really was was connected to as well. So first and foremost, I was given the confidence, I was given the tools and the encouragement by my family. 
second, when I did graduate from college with a, with a major in marketing and a minor in journalism, I went to go work at a company called the Philadelphia Business Journal. I was based outside of Philadelphia and, and went to work in Philadelphia. And my first boss was a woman. She was the head of marketing. And the publisher was another woman. Her name was Mary Huss, and she is still the publisher of um, the San Francisco Business Times. And so a lot of women talk about you need to see it to be it. And that really resonates with me because my first job, I had a woman boss and the woman that was running the entire organization was a, was, was a woman, the publisher. And so I saw it. I saw that it was possible. I was, they were role models to me and that really inspired me. So I think that was really critical. And there goes to my next mentor, which was um, Bill Bison. He was the original publisher of um, Investment News. He had quite a bit of faith in me. He gave me a lot of responsibility uh, to, to oversee sales for Investment News in the early years and really gave me a lot of confidence moving forward and was, was one of those male mentors that really got the importance of diversity in the workforce. And while he and I had different ways of thinking and communicating, we respected each other's styles a great deal. And so those are things that had really helped me, um, I think, become successful. That's awesome. You know, one of the things that I think is so important is family support in the messages that we get. And, and it's always great when you get a message of confidence growing up, especially if you're a woman, to kind of embrace your power. Uh, it also sounds like you had this unique opportunity to be in a male-dominated business, but have women as role models, and then later have a male mentor who really valued your different perspective, not to mention, you know, having worked with you on and off over the years, uh, what a hard worker you are. So, so often it's hard to get to a place of leadership or more challenging for a woman to be in a place uh, to be the CEO or be the publisher of um, a company. But I'm wondering, are there any advantages to being a female leader? It's almost sweeter once you have reached a certain success level because you can collaborate more with other women leaders and they tend to want to share best practices and learn from each other. And that's really been a highlight for me in my career. So I have to jump in and share the story that I that I often tell people about um, working on the Investment News Women's Advisors Summit. And I was fortunate enough to be asked by you and your colleague, Teresa, to do a four-city tour on breaking money silence uh, a few years back. And at the very end, you know, I, I get attached to people and you do run a very collaborative uh, environment and a collaborative team. So I really felt part of it, even though, um, you know, I only was working with the group for four times in a year. And on the way out, it was a cocktail party. And I said to Suzanne, I said, I would really like to stay in touch. And, um, you know, as appropriately so, Suzanne, you said something along, yeah, if there's other business opportunities. And I said, no, I just want to be friends. <laughs> 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 yeah, sometimes I have a, uh, depends what year that was, if we were having a, if we were, if we were constantly, if my mind was constantly on business. It's so <laughs> funny. But no, I, I honestly, I mean, I call you a friend. I feel like that has been one of the benefits of being a woman leader um, is that there's so many women that want to just share their experiences with each other. Sometimes you do need to share that. And women tend to want to do that, I think, a little bit more than men. Yeah, I, I think so, too. Now, the, the other thing that comes up, though, I, I think when we're talking about the difference between men and women in leadership is the whole idea of risk and uh, risk taking. And I know this is a generalization, but in your experience, how do you think taking risks or embracing risk has either benefited you or hurt you as a leader? So I think it's one of the hardest things to determine is like, when is the right time to take a risk? And I think a lot of times you have to go with your gut. And uh, one of the biggest risks I took was when I was 30 and I decided to leave my job at the Philadelphia Business Journal. I was, you know, had a great career there. I, you know, loved what I did. And I just knew that there needed to be more for me. And I wanted to move to New York. And that was a big risk. I, I left a 
you know, my, all my family, my friends, et cetera. And again, it was only New York. It wasn't like it was that far away, but it still was leaving out of your comfort zone and going to a much bigger pond, going to a national publication, not knowing a whole lot of people. And it was, the, I would say, one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life. And the second one, right, is, um, is leaving a job, uh, really a career. I felt almost like an owner of investment news, but leaving that to do something else. I was ready. I'd been ready for a while and to start my own business. And, you know, it's only been, you know, five months. So it's, I'm new in the game, but I couldn't be happier and I feel like this was the direction my life was will, was was going to take. So sometimes it's really critical to get yourself out of that comfort zone. I'd been doing the same job for a long time, and you, you have to challenge yourself. This is you have one life, you know. So that's what I would recommend to anyone listening: is you know, if you're feeling like a little bit of there's got to be something else take that chance and go through your worst case scenarios, which is what I did, but it can lead to just where you're meant to be and where it really brings you joy. It's interesting because I, I do think risk is such an important part of any, you know, any entrepreneurial, any business career. And you're right. It's like when to take the risk. And and I think for myself, when I look back and I think of the risks that I've taken, you know, on paper, they didn't always make sense. But intuitively, I had a sense that it was time to pivot. And it sounds like you kind of knew that for yourself before opening your consulting firm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there was there was it was just a matter of when. You know, and so the you know, there's never a great time, and it's it's all about challenging yourself and making sure that you're living your full potential. I think that's so important to always kind of take an assessment of where you are, what's making you happy, what's not making you happy, and where you really want to find joy. And looking at what you do and what what makes you the happiest and what you think you're the best at and where you really want to focus and what you want your legacy to be. And it's going to be different during different stages of your career. Mine was so different even five years ago. And it's really changed now. And it's um, it could change in five years. Who knows? But I think that we all owe ourselves to try and be our best and, and we deserve uh, the best and where we choose to work and spend our time is is a, is a huge part of our life. Yes, no, exactly. Now, now, part of the reason I started this series is because when I started talking about breaking money silence uh, in the book that I wrote and obviously this podcast, I kept coming back to this whole idea of, you know, there, there seems to be, in my opinion, some ambivalence still, or maybe a lot of ambivalence around the connection between women, money, and power. In other words, I really get a sense in the work that I tend to do with advisors as well as women entrepreneurs and business owners that even though we outwardly are saying, yes, women should embrace their financial power, it makes sense, we should learn more, we should be more involved, that very quietly, or maybe in some it's just not so quietly, there's there's this backlash or there's this ambivalence. Now, I'm wondering how you feel about that idea and... and if you've faced or experienced, whether it's gender bias or a sense that because you're a powerful financial woman, that that may be seen as an issue as opposed to a strength. I think there's still plenty of unconscious bias out there. There's still there's still conscious bias, but there's plenty of unconscious bias. And, and I do think that there are so many initiatives and firms and people that are trying to change that. It's like trying to turn the Titanic, right? It's it's a big issue and it's not going to change overnight. I think that I probably faced a little bit more gender bias when I was younger. And, you know, I've been in the, this particular industry for quite a long time. So luckily, I think I've earned respect and, and people know who I am at this point. But when I was younger and maybe not in the position that, you know, not in the position for very long. I remember going out to, to visit a large firm and I had my sales director with me, who was a man and uh, we were about the same age. And 
the person had never met us before who we were meeting with, the CEO. And they immediately thought that the sales director was the publisher and that I was the sales director. So there was an immediate like, well, the, the guy's got to be the, the one in, in charge here. And I remember like it was kind of a joke and the, and the, and the person was embarrassed. And, you know, I, I kind of, you know, always tried to be humorous about it, but made a very specific point at the end so that that mistake would never be made again. So it still is happening. Um, I still see it happening quite a bit with depending upon your industry, depending upon your title. And, you know, ap- absolutely. I-, I also still think that women who, and I don't like to generalize either, but tend to be a little bit more empathetic when they're, when they're, ma- when they're in management positions, maybe a little more understanding, maybe communicate a little bit differently, maybe put a, a larger emphasis on the importance of culture at your organization, that that can get misconstrued as as weak. And so I think, again, there's an unconscious bias with the way leadership styles are interpreted by those that may have different styles. But it sounds like part of what you did early on, for any listeners who are out there that are a little bit more junior in their career path, is the idea of Embracing it with a little bit of humor, but also setting a limit. It sounds, and knowing you, I have the advantage of knowing how you probably do that. And I may have even seen some of that in action. But it sounds like it's really, you know, addressing it in a way that's both, maybe the empathy is there, right? Empathetic for the person who's messed up, but also saying, you know, clearly I'm the one in charge. And so, you know, I think more importantly, let's talk about what you're doing to continue to change both the financial services industry and I would say the world at large, you know, over the past couple of years of working with you more closely. And and certainly in the last year, I've seen a huge push in your supporting women, not only in finance, I want to say that it's not even just in the financial sector, but recently we were at a charitable event and it was about supporting all women to be more financially powerful. But also you have a commitment to the next generation of professionals and and making sure there's more diversity and acceptance of people of color and people of um, different backgrounds are given similar opportunities as to, you know, middle-aged white men. And so I, I've been curious about what makes you so passionate about that mission. Well, thank you for that. And thanks for plugging Savvy Ladies, which I will talk about, which is the charity that you referred to and which you were also a part of the fundraising committee, um, amazing charity. So I just, I guess I believe that everyone should have the same chance in life, in work, in professional, personal, and women and, and other minorities just have not been valued the way that they should in the past and still aren't. So how do we create, and again, when I was in media, it was a, it was, it was a really cool platform to have to be able to address issues of that you just referenced. And so some of the things for those that are unfamiliar that are listening, when I oversaw investment news, I was able to launch some really significant and important initiatives that I think not only were really great for the industry and the the people that participated in them, but they were life-changing for me and actually helped carve out where my next step in my direction was going to be in my career. Um, so sometimes you start out by doing something for others and it turns out that you're the, you become the, the one that learned the most. So I was able to launch, you know, our women to watch women advisor summits, diversity and inclusion our you know, 40 under 40 next, you know, financial literacy initiatives, things like that. The reason that, again, I think that it's so important is it's it's all about fairness and making sure that everyone has a seat at the table. And I genuinely believe that a more diverse viewpoint, um, getting people involved that wouldn't normally be involved, making sure that people feel included is something that's just always been important to me. And as I got a better I would say get got more involved in the financial advice industry I, and realizing that you know it's 80% men and 20% women on average that there could be so many more it could just go so much further if there was a little bit more diversity 
in, in this industry. It's such an important industry for investors, for consumers. And I, I just wanted it to be the best it could be, quite frankly. And I thought in order to do that, it needed to embrace next gen and start a pipeline of, of new talent coming in. I thought we needed to elevate some of the, the wonderful women that were already in it and, and encourage others to join the industry and to provide a platform for more um, inclusion and, and being more open about things. And so it was, it's been wonderful. And I think it really has made a difference. I'm so proud of some of the initiatives that the industry is, is, is doing. And now with my own firm, I'm taking some of the learnings that I had from launching initiatives at Investment News and helping large corporations do the same thing and also to industry conferences to bringing some of that content and thought leadership to their events to really make sure that it's, you know, it's not just at Investment News, but it's throughout the industry that we're talking about it. What is one tip that you would leave our listeners with, keeping in mind that a lot of people who are listening in are women entrepreneurs, business owners, or the advisors that serve them? I think for women, sometimes we're a little humble about our success. And we don't want to be, we don't want to brag or, you know, at least that's how I feel. And I know a lot of other women, including yourself, feel the same way. But I think it's important to be proud of what we've accomplished as women and don't apologize for our success. Whether we realize it or not, other women and men are watching and learning from us and we have a responsibility to pay it forward. Thank you so much for sharing your insights on the podcast today. I've really enjoyed getting your thoughts, and I know our listeners have as well. Um, just before we end, tell us uh, where we can find out more information about your new consulting practice, even though your experience is uh, very wise. It is a new venture, so I want people to check it out. You can find me right now. I am, again, focusing in on business strategy, marketing, and advocacy initiatives within the wealth management industry. You can find me on LinkedIn, Suzanne Syracuse. That's probably the best way right now. I'll be launching my website by the end of the month, so stay tuned. Great. Well, thank you so much, Suzanne, for breaking money silence with me. Thank you for having me and for, for all that you're doing to empower women. Thanks. I just want to let people know who are listening in, if you are somebody who is struggling or wondering about the connection between women, money, and power, I really want to hear from you. Feel free to shoot me an email at kbk at breakingmoneysilence.com. We're going to be taking some of those questions on air over the next uh, couple of series or episodes. So don't hesitate to reach out and certainly check out breakingmoneysilence.com for more information or to subscribe to the podcast. Thank you for listening to Breaking Money Silence, hosted by Kathleen Burns Kingsbury, a wealth psychology expert, author, and founder of KBK Wealth Connection. If you like what you heard today, be sure to subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcast app and leave a review. Also, share this episode with your friends and family. It is a great way to get the conversation started. For more money talk tips and information, or to hire Kathleen to speak at your next event, go to www.breakingmoneysilence.com.